This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. No one is better equipped to be an eyewitness to global warming than Will Steger. For nearly half a century, he's been exploring the polar regions, experiencing firsthand the effect of global warming on indigenous cultures, wildlife habitat, and Arctic topography. Will is one of those rare persons who bridges two usually separate worlds, one of extreme adventure, the other of environmental education. Think Al Gore on a dog sled. <laughs> Actually, that strains credulity. Will is an explorer who has truly gone where few have gone before, and largely by dog sled, canoe, and kayak. He has returned not only to fuel the fantasies of armchair adventurers like myself, but also to tell us of a polar world whose magnificent ice caps are rapidly turning to water. This has made him a legend in the league of Amelia Earhart, Robert Peary, Roald Amundsen, and Jacques-Yves Cousteau, all of whom, with Will, have received the National Geographic Society's John Oliver Lagorce Medal for, and I read, and I quote, accomplishments in geographic exploration, in the sciences, and for public service to advance international understanding. Recounting Will's life of adventure can leave one exhausted, not to mention shivering, in amazement. His early explorations began with a 3,000-mile kayak trip from southern Alberta to northern Alaska in 1964. As of today, he's logged some 15,000 miles by kayak through Alaska, Canada, and the United States. But Will is best known for having led some of the most significant feats in the history of dog sled expeditions. These include the first confirmed solo dog sled, dog sled journey to the North Pole without resupply, a 1,600-mile south-north traverse of Greenland, the longest unsupported dog sled expedition in history, the historic 3,500 first-ever dog sled traverse of Antarctica, the first and only dog sled traverse of the Arctic Ocean from Russia to Canada's Ellesmere Island, and a solo expedition from the North Pole. During these expeditions, he pioneered online education, reaching tens of millions of students via online daily journals, including the first ever transmission of digital photography from the North Pole. Last year, Will led an expedition to Baffin Island to study the effects of global warning. This year included an expedition to Ellesmere Island to study the receding ice sheets, along with a Greenland kite ski expedition to document rising summer thaw levels and changes in the ice sheet. His plans for the coming year include a kite ski expedition through Western Antarctica. My plans include driving to Goleta after this program. Last year, we'll, um, in 2006, we'll establish the foundation to foster international leadership and cooperation on global warming by promoting environmental education and policy. The foundation's Global Warming 101 initiative seeks to engage individuals and policymakers, teaching them how to translate their climate concerns into action. His educational initiatives draw on his vast experience to make the abstract notion of global warming immediate 
bringing it home to today's policymakers and the young people who inherit their, their parents' rapidly deteriorating planet. Will Steger has taught science at the secondary level, founded a winter school, and developed an innovative wilderness program in Eli, Minnesota. He established the Global Center for Environmental Education at Hamline University in St. Paul and the World School for Adventure Learning at the University of St. Thomas. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Geology and a Master of Arts in Education in addition to honorary doctorates. He is the author of four books chronicling his adventures as well as the effects of environmental change. And last year, he received National Geographic Adventures Lifetime Achievement Award. It is truly an honor to introduce Will Steger, an eyewitness to global warming. Please join me in giving him a warm but polar-friendly Santa Barbara welcome. Will Steger. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Richard, for the fine introduction. Um, I too want to uh, thank Jenny Hunter, my long friend, and for making this possible, and uh, everybody for coming out tonight, the folks here at Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm not new to Santa Barbara. I used to take my summer vacations here in, in the 70s and 80s in the June to get away from the bugs of northern Minnesota, so it's a great town here. Um, I often get a, the question of how do you get involved in exploration, and uh, maybe my Minnesota roots might uh, answer some of that, but uh, I was raised in the city of Minneapolis, but I really have to thank, thank my parents. Um, from, I'm a, from a large family, nine kids. Uh, my dad was an entrepreneur, uh, and I was raised uh, pretty much with that type of spirit. Uh, as kids, we never had rules in the family, uh, as long as we got a certain grade point average, and we stayed out of trouble with the law. We could basically could do whatever we wanted to as long as we paid for it. So my first book that I read in third grade was The Adventures of Huck Finn. And that book actually kind of crystallized a vision of adventure and meeting people along the river. And uh, I was, had always been fascinated by the Mississippi River that runs between Minneapolis and St. Paul. And when I was 12 years old, uh, I used to caddy and cut lawns. I bought an old wooden boat and a motor, and I fixed that up. And all winter I worked on that. And when I was 13, I traded that in with a little bit more work. And by the time I was 15, three more trade-ins, uh, I had a pretty decent boat, and I took that down the Mississippi River with my older brother who was 17 from Minneapolis to New Orleans and back. And that was my uh, first and last motorized adventure. I, I was in debt for a couple years after that, paying for the gas money. And I started uh, climbing when I was 16. Uh, in Minnesota, no one climbed. Uh, I checked a book out of the library called uh, Mountaineering Freedom of the Hills and um, bought a hemp rope out of a hardware store and started top rope climbing at some of the cliffs there in Lake Superior, and from there I started kayaking. And I've had a very fortunate life. Of, uh, I've always known since a, a child here I wanted to be involved in uh, education. I always had a dear uh, concern for the environment and the innocence. And um, also, I always had that freedom of exploration that I think I got from the freedom my parents gave me. And I started doing major expeditions at a very young year. Uh, I, all through my high school, college, and my teaching, I, I taught through... Uh, Junior high science uh, in the late 60s. I taught actually global warming in the early in the early early 60s, and uh, from there I branched out. And uh, Richard told you so, some of my other background. Um, tonight I want to show you uh, some of the eyewitness accounts of what I've seen in the Arctic. Um, traveled there for about 40 years. Uh, the scientists 15 years ago said we'd see the first changes in the polar regions. And since these areas are so isolated, very few people have seen these. And unfortunately, there have not been enough eyewitness account of it, but I've seen it firsthand, uh, and especially the acceleration, incredible, the last five years, it's, it's uh, really quite shocking. But I think through my presentation tonight, I can put, give you a planetary perspective of the seriousness of the problem that we're talking about, and then we'll do some questions and answers that I can maybe pick it up with some solutions and so forth. But uh, I, first of all, I want to take you on an expedition across Antarctica to give you an idea what expeditions are about and um, how, we, uh, how we organize them. I use the pointer here. This is an international team, six people from six countries. Uh, 1989, uh, we crossed Antarctica, the longest possible route, 3,700 miles. We had a couple of uh, uh, glaciologists, Dr. Chin Da Hoyer from China. He uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore uh, a year ago, last, uh, last December. 
He was a co-chair of the IPCC, which was the International Body of Climatologists. Dr. Viktor Boyarsky, uh, climatologist from St. Petersburg, uh, Russia, there at the, um, the, the Arctic, uh, Antarctic Institute. Uh, my partner was Dr. John Lietien, a Frenchman from Paris, France, who I had met on the way to the North Pole three years before. My other team members included Jeff Summers, who worked with the British Antarctic Survey in the 80s. Uh, the British Antarctic Survey is the scientific arm of uh, the polar studies in England. And Jeffrey was in charge of the dogs back in the days when they used dogs for support of the expedition. So dog, Jeffrey had a great deal of not only dog experience, he was very familiar with uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. And then Keizo Fonatsu from Japan, another person of uh, great qualifications. So um, we had a special breed of dogs that we, we bred especially for this expedition. Uh, we call a polar husky. They're a cross of many northern breeds, the uh, Canadian and Greenland Eskimo dog, the McKinsey husky. Uh, some of the uh, Yukon dogs uh, in Alaska. Essentially, these dogs are weighed around 85, 90 pounds. They had this incredible racing-type drive, a spirit to them. Uh, very strong bodies. Their fur is super thick. Uh, their ideal temperature is 30, 40 below zero. Uh, they overheat at zero. You know, if it's above at red zero on a clear day, you have to be very careful with the dogs because they will overheat. Uh, but they're a pack animal. I mean, they're, they're raised in, in uh, families and are very well adjusted. And uh, they live for these expeditions, so they're well adapted to uh, the rigors of the trip. This is Antarctica. Uh, I personally, purposely chose this route because it was the longest. Um, prior to this, 13 men, um, the Scott, Amundsen, Mawson era, had penetrated the interior. Uh, only six of those men returned. It's a, Antarctica is an incredibly harsh area, especially in the high elevations. We had to leave in midwinter in order to do this expedition, July 15th on uh, northern um, Antarctic Peninsula. No one had ever crossed this, uh, been in the peninsula before in the winter, and we found out why. Uh, we crossed the Larsen Ice Shelf, which I'll talk about in a minute. That was the first section here. Then we, throughout the mountains here, we had a 56-day storm, incredible storm that we barely survived. As we got further into the interior, uh, we, we distanced ourselves from the storms. We got into really super cold weather. And then on to the, north, the South Pole. And then we crossed this area here, the area of inaccessibility had never been crossed before, had never been seen. Human experience had never been there. And 222 days later, we um, managed to reach the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Russian research station of Myrny. Now, Antarctica is divided into two geographic halves. This first area here, the longer, the bigger high plateau here is eastern Antarctica. This is a plateau 10,000 to 11,000 feet high, the coldest place on the Earth. Uh, very deep ice. Some of it goes down 14,000 feet. Uh, the oldest ice in the world, some of it's older than 800,000 years. Now, since this is such a massive um, uh, plateau, it creates its own weather system, and, and the interior of Antarctica has not been changed yet uh, from global warming. The, we're starting to see changes along the, the fringes, but what has scientists very concerned is this uh, ice sheet here. It's called the Western Antarctica Ice Sheet. Uh, this is a little bit different. It's called a marine ice sheet. It extends below the ocean. It's frozen below the ocean, but these marine ice shelves uh, are also backed up by what's called, uh, these marine ice uh, sheets are, are backed up by ice shelves. This is called the Ross Ice Shelf. Ice shelves float on the water. They're basically almost like an extension of the ice cap going out over to the, uh, the ocean. It's about 1,000 feet thick. But they buttress uh, against Western Antarctica. Western Antarctica are almost uh, predominantly surrounded by these uh, ice, sh ice shelves like this. But since they're at sea level, they're extremely vulnerable to uh, climate change, especially a rise of temperature. And we're starting to see a change of these ice shelves. If these ice shelves disintegrate, what happens is it uh, almost like turning a cork, a wine bottle on its hand, pulling the cork out, the wine flows out real quickly. So they dam up against the, uh, the continental. This I'm going to show you in a second here. Uh, the northern um, Antarctic Peninsula will be this shot here. And what we're looking at here is a mountain range, high mountain range, around 7,000, 8,000 feet. And then this flatter area here is called the Larsen Ice Shelf. There's the smaller Larsen A Ice Shelf, about 80 miles across, a mountain range, and the larger, larger uh, Larsen B Ice Shelf. This took us uh, 31 days to cross. I mean, this is how immense it is. Uh, both these ice shelves have since disintegrated. And I'll show you in a few minutes the disintegration of the uh, on satellite photos of the Larsen B. But I first wanted to show you what the Larsen Ice Shelf looked like before it disintegrated. These pictures are, in a way, historical because this ice that you're looking at, this ice shelf that's about 700 years old, uh, 700 feet thick, 12,000 years old, uh, no longer exists. I normally travel um, on large polar expeditions with uh, teams of six uh, with 30 dogs uh, broken up into three dog teams, 10 dogs. In other words, we have three dog teams, 10 dogs each. 
uh, sled that at the beginning of an expedition will weigh up to 1,200 pounds, maybe supplies between 40 and 45 days with the supplies of fuel, available fuel and food and clothing and uh, radio and so forth. And then two people uh, live off the sled. In other words, our tent units are in there. So we have these three separate tent units, totally self-sufficient. In case we lose an entire sled unit or two sled units in a crevasse, for example, we still could survive. We travel on skis all the time. We don't ride. There isn't a place to ride on the sled, even if you wanted to, for a couple reasons. For one, the only way you keep warm is by movement, and we, we do a 10-hour day. Normally travel 10 straight days. Uh, one day off, and then if you ride, you also wear out the dogs. Uh, so this is the best arrangement with 10 dogs, uh, uh, three dog teams like this. This is the Larson AI shelf here, mountain range that separates these two bodies here. We crossed about a dozen mountain ranges along the way. This was our first. Uh, uh, we had, as you're going up and down, of course, you have uh, and glaciers, you have crevasses. We're always roped up in these type of situations. Um, we all had considerable experience, not only in cold weather, but climbing experience. But it's a little bit travel, different uh, traveling in the mountains uh, like this with dog teams, a little bit a little more trickier. This is one of the big dangers that we faced were these huge crevasses. This one, of course, was very obvious. It, uh, bridge had, ice bridge had collapsed probably a month before. It gave us a good photo opportunity. But you can see the, you know, the consequences here if, if the bridge did collapse. Uh, it could swallow a team or two teams. Uh, the problem is that most of these uh, huge voids like this were covered with uh, ice bridges of, of ice, uh, snow that drifted over. Clear weather, you can see these by small, thin ribbons, uh, kind of grayish ribbons in front of you. You always do, you can tell there's crevasses underneath there, but in whiteout conditions, uh, you have to probe ahead. You don't see here in the picture, there's a couple uh, team members with uh, roped up probing ahead, checking. We were very fortunate. We didn't have any major incidents, snow, didn't lose any sleds. Uh, several of the dogs went in, but they were tied in through their harness systems, and we just a matter of pulling them up again. Uh, we were up at high elevation uh, six out of the seven months, uh, between seven and 11,000 feet. But at high elevation, we had extreme wind chills. Uh, average wind chill is 60 to 80 below zero. Uh, we, we dressed like space people. You couldn't expose skin at this. Uh, fingers would freeze instantly. But you get used to traveling like this. It's almost like being outer space in a way. Uh, but it's amazing how adjusted uh, the human spirit is. I mean, you really adapt to this. You don't really after a while. You always have to be on the guard, but you're not thinking that much. And traveling like this, you're never, you know, 99.5% of the time, you're very relaxed. It's seldom that you're fearful or anything. The crevasses are a little adrenaline rush, but uh, we had these big storms that were quite dangerous. But uh, it's just pretty much uh, uh, just a way of traveling. Uh, coming down to the Larson B-Ice Shelf, we had our first uh, short storm, uh, pretty mild for Antarctic standards since it was sea level, about 50 mile an hour winds, 20, 30 mile, 30 below zero. Uh, in these storms, the dogs curl up in tight little balls. They cover up their faces with their tails, and within 20 minutes, half an hour, they're, they're totally covered by the snow. And like an hour after you make camp, if you look outside from your tent, uh, you don't see the dogs at all. They're all underneath the snow. They're extremely warm. Uh, they can breathe quite easily in the light snow, but they're extremely bored. They wait for the storm to end, and this one was a short storm. Two days, two days later, we're out of the tent, and the dogs are always waiting for the sound of uh, footsteps in the snow. They can't hear the wind, but they can hear the sound of a footstep, and as soon as you step outside, the dogs start popping up from underneath the snow all over, and uh, they're very happy to get going. I mean, you, you think these dogs are just an incredible spirit. There's always a few dogs there stay closer to the tent um, or, the, or the sleds, and they get buried in deeper drifts. We relocate them and get them dug out, and they're ready to go here. This is the Larson B ice shelf. Uh, this is uh, what an ice shelf looks like. Uh, flat, absolutely perfect travel, perfect conditions, uh, no elevation problems, very few, if any, crevasses. Um, every ice shelf that I've traveled on uh, in my career has disintegrated. The Larson A and B. Uh, in the northern hemisphere of the Isles ice shelf that broke up uh, three years ago, the Ward Hunt ice shelf that broke up this summer, uh, the Markham ice shelf that broke up also this summer. Uh, so, but I wanted to show you here, Larson, this is the Larson B, what it, what it looks like in, before it collapsed. Uh, this is, again, just a refresher of the distance here, 350 miles, you get a, guy, a, a size, 31 days of travel. Notice this mountain range here, that'll be our reference point right here in this next slide. This is in uh, January of 2002, six years ago. Uh, this is the mountain range right here. Notice the Larson A is gone. That disintegrated in uh, uh, 1998. And this is here is right the day before the Larson broke up. What you're looking at here is the Larson Ice Shelf. It's about 150 miles from the ocean to these glaciers. These are some of the longest glaciers in the world. 
Uh, and now, as long as the ice shelf's in place, the glaciers are moving at a glacial pace of several meters a year. What happened here, uh, the, the O2 was a record warm year in the Antarctic Peninsula, probably for the first time in 12,000 years. A large quantity of snow and ice melted on the surface, forming huge lakes. All these striations, these dots are big lakes. And when you get water on top of ice, it's a problem because that water then trickles through the cracks and the fissures of the ice, which changes the structure of the ice. In northern Minnesota, um, when you're ice fishing, uh, eight inches of solid ice you can drive a truck on. But if that ice gets wet, the truck will go right through. It totally changes uh, the structure. And this is what happened on a planetary scale. Uh, the, the water destructuralized the ice on February 1st, 2002. We had the first collapse on the south end. These are the size of uh, small New England states here. And that caused a chain reaction that went on, what went on for the, for the next, uh, I'll redo this, whoops, get back here. This chain reaction went on for a whole month and this entire ice shelf completely collapsed into the ocean. Now the scary part about this is it, ca it caught the scientists by surprise. The scientists have been actually quite accurate in their predictions. They've been actually on the conservative sides. But they had no idea that an uh, uh, ice shelf half the size of Maine could just suddenly disintegrate. And this is the scary thing about global warming, because you have these sudden uh, thermodynamic changes that instantly change that. Now with the ice shelf disintegrated, uh, it was floating on the ocean, so you didn't see a sea level rise. But with it gone now, these um, long glaciers, these glaciers now are surging very quickly in the ocean. And that's where we're going to start seeing uh, the sea level rise. The Ross ice shelf that I showed you, uh, if that disintegrated, we'd see a rapid rise to sea level. This is just a, you know, minuscule, very slow, but it's the beginning of something that's in process that uh, we really need to take action with the carbon dioxide that I'll talk about. This is the, t the top of the Greenland ice cap, the second largest green uh, ice cap in the world. This is 10,000 feet high. In 1988, we crossed that south north 1,600 miles as a training for Antarctica. No one had ever run dogs uh, for any extended period at 10,000 feet, so we felt we wanted to do this a trip like this. We also needed to see exactly how far could we go if we didn't, if we weren't resupplied. We also worked on diet and a number of things, team dynamics. Uh, but to get a sense, we went 60 straight days like this on this immense area. Uh, this is Greenland here. Uh, some of you may have flown from uh, north, it's between North America, of course, and, and Europe. Uh, your uh, flights through Europe sometimes fly over this area. This is 1992, again, 1,600 miles across here. Contains about 12% of the world's fresh water locked up in ice, and if that went in the water, broke up, it's uh, stable still, except for some problems near the edges, we'd see a sea level rise of around 24 feet. Now what you're looking at here in 1992, the red area, red areas are the summer thaw levels. In other words, the thawing level here went up to about 700 feet in, in 92, not a major incident. This is 10 years later. Uh, we have a thawing level now going up to 3,000 feet. You can almost visualize this. The Arctic is really rapidly warming, and that warmer weather gets higher and higher in the ice caps. Now, this is uh, three years later. Notice it's up to 5,000 feet. Unfortunately, you don't have the slide for 07, but the 07 warming, the thawing level went up to 7,000 feet. Now, again, 5,000 feet of ice is not going to melt in a short summer season, but the problem here, again, is water. You have a rapid runoff, huge amounts of water, uh, more water than... Uh, that goes off out of the Amazon River in the summer, flows off the Greenland ice cap. And unfortunately, this water doesn't flow to the ocean. It flows, it gathers in creeks and streams and rivers, and then flows right into holes and crevasses, which then flows underneath the glaciers, which lubricates these massive ice sheets as they flow into the ocean. So what you have here, then, is a massive surging of glaciers uh, into the ocean. The last three years, we've, uh, we've had a huge amount of ice going into the ocean. Uh, it was so violent at times it show, showed up on the Richter scale, point six and seven on the Richter scale. Um, uh, Richard, man, I we mentioned that I, we crossed Greenland last year, and uh, we crossed Greenland east to west by kite ski. This was not this during the summer. We didn't travel by dogs, but by kites and skis. This is a large kites that are about 125 feet lines that are attached to us. We're on uh, Telemark downhill skis. Uh, we were training here right on the eastern ice cap here, we're, we're getting ready to cross, cross the, uh, the main ice shelf here, 
while we're training, kind of getting in shape, getting our kites and gear set up. It's a really beautiful way of traveling. We travel with sleds. Uh, the sleds weigh around 200 pounds. Uh, in Antarctica, you can travel uh, 1,500 to 2,000 miles, totally unsupported. So you can go totally uns unsupported into areas that are virtually almost unexplored. Uh, you have this belt around you. Uh, you put on regular, regular skis, um, nothing unusual, telemark skis. And then you attach your, with your line here, the back line goes in, uh, into your harness. There's not a very big wind, as you can see, about seven, eight mile an hour wind. And then you get ready to launch the kite. Even in a small wind like this, you can, you can do quite well in distances. And you, you launch it like this and off you go. So we started off then, we went up to about 8,000 feet on the ice cap. And um, you can see how we travel here. It's pretty, pretty efficient. This is up about 7,000 feet, to, you know, very quiet. When the wind blows, you travel anywhere from 24 hours to 36 hours straight. Sometimes you're, because the wind stops, you rest. You see, you control the, you control the kite with your arms. Uh, the kite itself is snapped into your harness. Um, you have helmets because you can, if you overpower, you can get dragged or pulled into the air and then dumped on your head. So it's a fall in this uh, sport is very memorable. And uh, this is a crosswind here, which is very easy. And um, this is now going up over the ice cap. You can see how, how we traveled here. But then we got down on the western side at 6,400 feet. Uh, we started running into uh, running water. It's right here. This is... Uh, mid-July, July 15th, and this is probably the first time ever you had flowing water at this elevation, you know, probably for 100,000 years. Uh, the streams weren't that large at first. We could still get across with our sleds. But as we got further down at 5,400 feet, uh, we start getting larger streams, and like this, running water. And then these streams gained more momentum into larger streams. And at 5,000 feet, we were totally stopped. We couldn't go any further. And uh, later we would hear that sound. You never hear the sound. Uh, this is global warming. And this is on the ice cap. This is supposed to be frozen. We were picked up by a plane, a twin otter on skis, and flew over. And I'll notice this is a large river, half a mile wide, flowing on the ice shelf. Look what happens to it. See, it disappears. Goes underneath the ice. Here's another huge one. This is, I mean, you, you just have to see it for yourself. We flew over at 3,000 feet on the way back. You could still see way down these streamlets, but you, don't, you can't get an idea unless you travel foot by foot the immensity of this and, and, and what, this, what this means. I mean, if you study glaciology as a geology, this is the edge of the ice sheet here. This goes on and on, these, these, this calving. Calving is normal, but not to this incredible extent here. This is like a 12, 14-story building here lifting into the air and tipping on its side like this. This is the rise of the sea level that we're starting to see now. Now scientists say we have to reduce our carbon emissions 80% by 2050, but it's right now reducing, you know, making that immediate change right now. Uh, the main goal here is really to try to stabilize the climate enough so that we can manage the sea level rise that's starting. Scientists talk also, there's several other things that you need to be concerned with. And one is the, what's called the permafrost, and this, um, we'll show this here. This is the North Pole here, uh, Arctic Ocean, larger than the United States. North Pole, normally a thin layer of, of ice, about six feet now in the winter, over 15,000 feet of water. So it's three miles deep of, of wa uh, water at the pole. Uh, surrounding the Arctic Ocean is Eurasia and North America. These white areas are permafrost, permanently frozen ground, three million square miles of permanently frozen swamp and bog. Now, as long as the swamp and bog is totally frozen, it, of course, does not interact with the atmosphere. But what we're now starting to see, and you're reading it in the papers, um, you're starting to see the thawing in the summer of the permafrost. You're having some major structural problems in Alaska. Uh, you have uh, two villages at, on the western Ant uh, uh, Alaska here, they're totally collapsing into the ocean, almost totally gone. Pipelines that are starting to become disabled, roads, buildings, everything that's built on this permafrost uh, is starting to change at, at a very uh, infrastructure, very expensive. And, but on the environmental side, it's something just as serious because as this permafrost starts thawing, when organic material gets above 32, it starts decomposing. And when it decomposes, it gives off 
carbon dioxide and methane. And met methane is a 21 times more dangerous greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And this is extremely serious because once this starts in process, it's called a feedback loop. You get more and more, more methane and, and it gets cyclical. It gets more and more. Uh, the permafrost looks like this in the wintertime. It's hard to tell if you're on ground or lake or swamp. Uh, in the summertime, it's really quite obvious. You have dogs. The dogs here, if you dig down here, there's maybe 8 or 12 inches of moss, and then the frozen ground, you hit the ground right underneath that. That's the permafrost. This is what the scientists, or this is the present rate of permafrost. The green here is very deep bog, hundreds of feet thick. Normal situation as it is now. Scientists are predicting if we continue you know, business as usual, emitting the same amount of carbon dioxide as we have right now, in 50 years we'd lose 50% uh, of, of the permafrost. This would be catastrophic. This would be, um, we would be on, on the fast track to losing all the ice in the world, about 280 foot sea level rise, I should say. So this would be, and I really don't think that, we're, I'm sure that we're going to get control on our emissions. But if we continue to another 50 years, um, this is the seriousness. We would lose 90% of that, which would be a uh, Cretaceous di dinosaur era. So if you see here, you can almost visualize the methane is locked into plant materials, frozen, not interacting. But as it thaws, where does it go? It changes into a gaseous material, methane, into the atmosphere, which increases the warming. Uh, this is the top of the world. Um, this is what I consider uh, the tipping point. Um, the the north, northern part, of, north of the Arctic Circle is, is mostly, has been up until 20 years ago, mostly snow and ice with a short summer season. But the Arctic Ocean itself and the surrounding ice, which is a huge, huge area, has been covered 90 to 95 percent ice even in the summertime. Now, the issue here is that you get 24 hour light and the polar regions for 150 days. So that, that's a heck of a lot of solar radiation constantly hitting the globe. That's more radiation than what strikes the, 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 uh, uh, the um, tropical areas. Uh, but now as it starts warming, you, you're get, starting to get some of that sea ice is starting to melt. And as it melts, of course, it exposes warmer water or warmer or darker water, darker land surfaces, and then you get more absorption. And this is what's starting to happen. Up until uh, recently, the last 7,000 years, uh, we've had a relatively stable climate. Now, within that stable climate, you get lots of natural variations. But it was, it's, if you look at the 700,000-year record, it's probably the longest, warmer, stable area of what we've had in 700,000 years, if you look at the ice core records of Antarctica and Greenland. Um, and that's enabled us as a species to evolve through uh, uh, ag agriculture and so forth. But now that's starting to change. I want to show you, I have a short clip. Uh, we crossed the Arctic Ocean in 1995 from this island, uh, to the pole down to Canada. And I, then on this picture, you'll, sh you'll be a helicopter coming in, and then we start moving uh, on the ice here. We ba basically run the dogs all the way across, lots of open water. And we get this close to Canada, the ice starts getting, is too dangerous to continue on, on dog sleds, which we anticipated. There the dogs are flown out, and you'll see pictures of us hauling these canoes to get over the ice and into the water. So. I'll see if we can run this, and I'll narrate over this as we go. This is the Russian, the Russian helicopter. This is 54 below zero. Uh, perfect temperature for us because this ice is moving all the time. You want it to be super cold to keep the ice in, keep the ice from uh, moving. Now, notice this is moving ice. You can actually see it moving. You can hear the noise. It's almost like a wooden ship that's being crushed. This is typical of the Arctic Ocean. It's real dynamic. It's not moving that you can't get away from it. And there's a couple of features on the Arctic Ocean. Big pressure ridges where these big plates of ice come together and you have to chop. You're basically a, a road construction crew. But in the 90s, um, we started seeing incredible changes. Open water, temperatures 20 to 30 degrees warmer in some areas in the summer, uh, which made it extremely difficult to get dogs over this area. This, these two plates of ice now are trying, starting to separate. And we're trying to get the dogs across here before uh, one sled gets isolated on the other side. So a little bit of urgency here. And uh, dogs are trained to keep going to kind of short circuit their natural tendency of panicking. A little bit of, there's a lot of open water right where the dogs are jumping here.
I was always the last of the three here. It always ice is the worst, but just out of perspective, it's totally open water here. But you're just gonna go over it like that. And you got a thousand pound sled. You don't want to drop it in the water. And this is on the Canadian side. We use dogs are flown out uh, canoe sleds, which are a lot of work. Okay, now here she comes. Patience is a very important thing of an explorer here. 30, 40 miles of this at a time. And then open water like this. This is where the canoes were great, because you couldn't travel like this with dogs. Uh, extremely cold water. I mean, if you fell in here, it would be pretty serious. We're in dry suits. We got clothing over it. And this is coming into a northern Ellesmere. Actually, this is the Isles Ice Shelf coming into it. That broke off, as I mentioned, in 2005. Well, this is what we're seeing. I talked about the tipping point, the Arctic Ocean. Um, 20 years ago, up until 20 years ago, mostly uh, snow and ice, a little bit of thawing in the summer. But 98% of that energy that hits ice reflects back off. Up, and that's, you know, keeps the Earth cool. This is what it was in the 90s, where we started to get a little bit more thawing. This is what's called a positive feedback loop. In other words, global warming first starts the thawing of the ice. Okay, the ice starts thawing, and then that causes its own feedback. In other words, more thawing, more absorption, and this process starts. This situation, three years ago, the scientists were predicting a century or a century and a half from now. This happened last year. Last year, there was an incredible breakup of, of the multi-year ice on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, we lost 50% of the sea ice on the Arctic Ocean, which was, um, it shocked scientists. It just, they couldn't see it. I thought it was coming, but I didn't, I, myself, I was, I think I had a, a better clue than the model, science models, but I thought maybe this would be 20, 25 years, but it happened last summer. But this is the, this is the change of the heat balance here. This situation, scientists three years ago were saying two centuries from now. They're now saying 10 years from now. In fact, what the, the Navy is saying, I mean, I, I work with the uh, Norwegians, the Scandinavian com companies, countries. Uh, the, the navies are, are preparing to, for a sea route to cross the Arctic Ocean uh, in another 10 years from now. They figure they'll have a four-month uh, season of going over. You've heard about the Northwest Passage, you know? They're, they won't even use the Northwest Passage. There's no, no reason to go through Canadian territory and all the rocks and all this. But... Uh, so the sea lanes are actually going to open up. But this is what I call, I, I think, what I would consider the tipping point. It's called an albedo flip, where you go from a reflective surface to an absorptive surface. And this is a, quite a serious thing. This will show you summer sea ice of 1979. This is in the September. This is a little misleading because this is broken ice, maybe 70% chopped ice, but this is uh, totally totally solid ice. This is uh, 2005, you know, 25% of it. This was the big breakup last year, 2007. Um, and of course, we've got our beloved polar bear, the icon of the Arctic. Uh, this bear, of course, relies on the, on the sea ice uh, to make a living. It, it hunts the, what's called the ring seal. The ring seal lives on the ice in the summertime, and the only way the bear can get the seal is to, is to track down and hunt the bear on the ice. If the ice is gone, the seal cannot catch the seal. Uh, in the, the bear can't catch the seal in the, in the water. So we're looking at uh, a situation here with the bear on thin ice, but at the same time, uh, humanity's on thin ice. Um, last year, for the first time, uh, demand outstrips supply of our, our energy. We start seeing that as uh, spike prices rising. Uh, we also very aware now, finally, what we do have a, a serious security issue here, relying on 70% of foreign governments on, for our petroleum. And uh, most of those governments are not very friendly to us, Iraq and Venezuela, to name a few. Um, and then we just had the financial collapse here uh, three weeks ago. And I believe the only way this uh, economy is going to come back together, and I believe it will come together, but it's going to take a little bit of time, but it'll be around the new energy transformation. Uh, what we need here is a, a real serious effort um, not just, uh, we need it to be put against the wall, I think, like this. Uh, Americans are really good at moving when their backs are, are against the wall. Uh, we saw that uh, in Apollo project that was fairly minor, but the World War II effort that we had where we retooled an entire economy. Well, we, we're going to have to have a very similar thing. Um, the great thing about this is 
the new green economy and the new jobs uh, from the new uh, energy sources, technology, energy efficiencies are all jobs that can be made in this country. Uh, the wind, the solar, all this technology, we, we send out over close to a trillion dollars a year that goes from our hard-earned money out to foreign governments. Uh, in the future, as we become more energy self-sufficient, that money will recycle into the economy. It's really jump-starting this new economy. Um, like I mentioned, the scientists say we need to reduce 80% by 2050. That's a long-range plan. Um, but it's really right now when we're all part of an economy and we're all beneficiaries of this great time that we've had up until now of cheap energy. It's given us uh, the edge on other country, competitive edge over the other countries. I mean, we're 3% of the population that consumes 25% of the resources. Um, but now that's changing because of the cost, and uh, we're all, we all know the reality of it. But uh, I think there's a silver lining to this economic issues because uh, I think, like I said, I think the real issue is uh, the green jobs and moving in that direction. We can talk about a little bit about that through our, our um, questions and answers here. I want to keep us on time. I just returned from an expedition in northern Ellesmere Island. I'll show you here. Uh, northern Ellesmere, the Arctic Ocean's here. Um, Alaska here for your reference in Greenland. Northern Ellesmere is this island here. I'll show you a close-up of it here. And um, I led a team of six 21- uh, to 28-year-olds year old, from uh, four countries. Uh, these weren't the ordinary young person all off, out of the, off the street. These are seasoned explorers, some of the best dog mushers in the country, in the world, some of the best kiters in the world. Uh, they all had a considerable experience in, in the, um, the Arctic. We got along fine. Our goal was we left Resolute, and we were going to dog sled up these islands uh, to the last remaining ice shelves. Um, uh, but unfortunately, with the, unexpectedly, the, I, the ice of the Arctic Ocean broke up here last year, and all this broken up ice was jammed in by major storms all, all the way through here, through this whole 700 miles, which is normally a really flat area. So we did manage to make it up here, but we did make it to some of the ice shelves. Uh, the, uh, we wanted to make it to the Ward Hunt and the Malcolm, Markham ice shelf that did collapse a couple months after our expeditions. But I have a short little video here where I'm summarizing about that um, expedition. I talk a little bit about my, the Will Steger Foundation. Um, our, our foundation is basically, we, through education and raising awareness, we drive policy. In other words, we drive the constituency. We move, make a populist movement uh, into driving policy, making it popular for uh, elected officials, or if the elected officials don't cooperate, they don't get voted in anymore in Minnesota, which I think they do here also in California. But, but I want to run this to show, it gives you a little bit of history of, of that trip, and after that I'll do some questions. When you see the, the changes like we saw, the collapse of the Arctic Ocean and traveling on that sea ice that broke up, and this was the tipping point, the Arctic Ocean broke up, all this ice went down into the area that we were traveling in. And to experience that firsthand, it, it does change your life, changes your perspective. And uh, I think it has a tendency of, of making people more committed. Our, our goal is, is, we had several goals. One, we, we wanted to bring our audience uh, to the front lines of global warming. We did that mainly through the websites, a little bit through the media. And uh, not only working with our six emerging leaders were ba basically our conduit to that generation. It wasn't just for their sake, but it was the, that was the way to reach the younger generation, of course, is through their peer group. And uh, so we wanted to bring the eye, eyewitness account. Uh, our main goal, though, was to really inspire people into action. And other than showing, okay, this is a real disaster here, look, look at what's happening. Uh, the, need, the need that we need to really take this on in a real positive way. Uh, look at alternative ways, ways that we can change our lifestyle uh, for the better and also increase our quality of life. And uh, so we, we hope through the, the project and through the ongoing efforts that we're doing is to inspire people to really take action because uh, unless we really take action in our personal lives and in our, our own uh, circle of influence, you know, uh, it's a great entertainment, it's a great project, but it uh, doesn't get anywhere. And one of the major successes of the team is just incredibly uh, molded together, great, great friends. Uh, success of an expedition could be in, in di different ways. And I first of all, look at a team. Did we set a good example? We want people to cooperate and get along and take this on in a very positive light. <laughs> the team did really well. It's funny that. below here. <laughs> we didn't make our ultimate objectives of the uh, of the uh, ice shelves because we were stopped by the, this unexpected ice that 
uh, plugged away, but that was, in a way, I was, I felt very fortunate to have traveled through that and actually uh, had saw, saw that ourselves. It wasn't just street awareness and education. Um, a lot of the work we do is policy. We, we, we want to drive our, our lawmakers, both Republicans and Democrats, into the right direction here in making good decisions, and especially in the policy level. So our work is a lot to do with policy, and that's ongoing. So if you, if you inspire several million people, especially the younger generation, uh, and they're moving forward, uh, and that helps us on our policy work, so it's an ongoing it's an investment that you put in and it, keep, it keeps growing. It isn't just one expedition, but it's an ongoing effort to get, get the move policy through general education and, and inspiration of people. Yeah, we came back uh, first day we were in New York City, believe it or not, and uh, we met Al Gore that one of the second evening that we were there. And I asked him, I, I'd worked with Alan in the 80s on, on the, the climate change issues before and uh, asked him about the, the ice, and he was very familiar with that. He said that was, was the breakup of the Arctic Ocean. And he did give us some the, the, the top ice scientists that we called up, and uh, they confirmed. And they, they were actually curious to get our sort of um, boots-on-the-ground analysis of what, what we saw, because they, they observed this through satellite photos, but no one had ever been on the ground there to observe that. I think we were probably, I'm sure that we were the first ones to travel through it. Will's... Uh going to the Arctic and showing what's actually happening now, I think makes the message much clearer. Um, we can talk about the science, and about the theory, but you need to see what is really happening. And that uh, is what he shows so, uh, so wonderfully. And also, he is successful in getting young people and educators, and that's what we, we have to do so that the next generation realizes what is at stake. And um, I think the combination of the science and the explorer part is what is very effective. You know, the younger generation uh, gets so serious that uh, when they're my age, the world is going to be totally different. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the start of the great sea level rise is already starting. I think we've already reached that tipping point where uh, we still have some control in the next 10 years if we take it serious. If we can level off our carbon emissions, that will be a major uh, victory for the human race. But even if we do that, um, Global when carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere, the well, majority of that stays for 100 years. So we're going to see some major changes. But it's not that we don't have solutions. Uh, we have a lot of solutions. The whole issue here is to get uh, the younger generation that's really got to take ownership of this and uh, speak out about it, organize. Okay. Let's see the last. Great. Okay. Let me just, uh, we can do some questions in a minute. Let me just talk, because uh, I always get the question, what do we do? Um, I think the first step, we've got to take this on in our own lives personally. We've got to look at ourselves, uh, not ex expect our leaders to lead the way for us. We, we really have to take initiative ourselves. And that's, first of all, in our personal life, our habits, we can look at that, what we can do to uh, curb carbon dioxide. I mean, Energy prices, Minnesota, the, ener the electrical price, uh, electricity is going up 17% this year and uh, in, Minas in Minneapolis. It's going to go up 33% in the next three years. So cheap energy is gone. But we got to look at, so it's not just global warming and doing the right thing. It's how are we going to, you know, save ourselves money. So these go uh, conservation goes hand in hand. So in our personal life, just our habits and what we, and you know, I don't have to give you the 10 steps to do it. I, you should know that or get on the website or check out our website, globalwarming101.com. But from there, though, um, we really need to engage because uh, we all have a tremendous amount of influence from our friends, from the community that we belong with, our congregations, our schools, wherever we work with, we can organize, connect with other people. And that's what I'm seeing uh, that's going on. In Minnesota, we totally changed the political landscape there in the last uh, two, three years. Um, uh, this, the state that was kind of slow on the draw on this, although you know we always have a good name for doing good things up there, but uh, it's amazing. I started working in the conservative churches. I went, I went where the uh, resistance was the most, the conservative areas and uh, schools and so forth. But in the churches, they caught on to the moral issues, and it's amazing how they organized. And around that, once you got, we got 
the uh, electorate organized, we drove the, the elected officials, the conservative officials at, on our side, on, on the conservative, you know, conser I would say the environmental conservative side, and from there we really, really changed the landscape. The, uh, we have to do this from bottom up and top down because we all can't do it alone, but we also have to engage and we've got to get our elected officials engaged. And I'm hoping on this next uh, election coming up a week from tomorrow uh, that we're going to see some real, real honest change here. I, I'm very hopeful that things will go in the right direction. Uh, on the Will Stigger Foundation, we do not take, uh, we're nonpartisan. We don't take sides, uh, which is sometimes real hard to do, but it's good discipline. But we really keep it in the middle. What we're seeing in Minnesota and the Midwest is global warming and the global warming solutions are drawing both sides in together. It's really incredible how our state is becoming unified and, and our surrounding states around this area, and I think it might, might be happening here. So there's some very good things. Um, I've been working on global warming for over 30 years. It's been a tough battle. Uh, but I, four years ago, I decided to leave my home in the wilderness and uh, to work full time on this because I really felt the time was now. I moved to the city of Minneapolis and started my nonprofit. But at that time, I kind of struggled how to get, where, was the, where were the solutions? And I realized that the major problem was that our society was socially disengaged. Uh, there's a book called Bowling Alone, which was an inspiration to me three or four years ago. It talked about social engagement. I was from the 50s, 60s generation when we were really engaged as a society. And then during the 70s and 80s, we became disengaged for various reasons. We can blame a number of things for that, I guess. But, uh, but through global warming, I think we're starting to see it here, the fact that we're drawing a big audience. Uh, in the Midwest, we, had, we draw thousands of people on a, on a, on a, regular, uh, a regular time. Uh, but it's this engagement now that's getting around it, which is really the positive thing. But why don't we, I'm going to keep it on time. Maybe we can do 10 minutes or so of questions if we can get some lights in the back of the room. You uh, mentioned that behind closed doors, scientists uh, will talk about the, the truth of the matter. And I understand that there's a desire not to shock people into um, non-action. But I'm wondering if you could comment on two things. One is uh, the notion that perhaps we need a little more shock therapy to get us out of our uh, apathy and our obsession with the, the economic downturn. And also, if you could put that in light of your experience with, with you know, speaking with younger people and, and yep. what, their, what their reaction is. Good, thanks. I'll conclude with that. Um, I think we got the shock therapy that we needed uh, three weeks ago when the markets collapsed. I've been, I think we were living, as we found out, <laughs> too high in the hog with too many cars in the garages, and uh, this, is going, this has changed. We, we have no sense yet of what this means, but it's trickling down. I run a, a nonprofit with six people, and uh, two of the men that work for me, one on the website, one on the media end, their wives are the real breadwinners, which allow them to work for a, a nonprofit. They both got their notices today that they've got two more weeks. And uh, so we're, we're in, a, in a little bit of a problem, and we, we, we haven't felt that yet. But the way out of that, again, we also, as I mentioned, the, the uh, security issue of relying on foreign oil. Uh, but the way out of that is, is going to be start building this economy around our jobs and so forth, which is going to take some time. But uh, I think we got the shock therapy that we needed. Hopefully we won't get too many natural disasters. I mean, Galveston got wiped off the face of the earth. It was incredible. It was huge. It wasn't like an isolated storm, but it was immense. And it wiped out another city. Now, are they going to rebuild there? I mean, I, I wouldn't... Uh, <laughs> wouldn't buy a property in Galveston or New Orleans. New Orleans is a doomed city, that whole coastline. So, you know, hopefully we won't get too many natural disasters like that. But I think the economic slap in the face here uh, is going to be a wake-up call. It's going to be a tough one. But I, th I think we're going to excel in that in the long run. Uh, in terms of the youth, um, that's where my, I have my chips. Uh, it's not just K-12 education. It's this incredible movement that's going on. It's in Minnesota, it's the Midwest. Uh, Obama's tapped into that energy. Uh, this generation from um, basically juniors in high school up where you can start organizing up to the upper 20s is an incredible generation, uh, really well socially interconnected. Uh, they're almost like my, uh, when I was in the 60s generation, socially minded, uh, ability to organize. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, what we needed was a galvanized voice for global warming. 
of uh, tens of millions of, of generations saying, this is our issue. I used to lobby the uh, Senate and Congress uh, four years ago. It was a really uphill battle with these. I used to get arguments in the offices with these guys. And there I was just trying to inform them that global warming was real. But I would always bring in a couple real articulate young people. And in these arguments, the young people would always say, how about me? I am really concerned. And it would always, it always make the room silent. But uh, we need this generation to step forward because it is your, it's your, this is your issue. It's your opportunity. Uh, it's also quite amazing what's happening. Um, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh graders I'm seeing around the country, these kids are just incredible, reorganized. I mean, they're excited. Uh, they know all about global warming. Uh, I always tell them, teach their parents and teach their parents' friends. You know, I, I, I tell them, this is a different situation. Your parents and your teacher, your adults used to teach you. This is a situation where you've got to teach them. So it's really, and, and our organizing that we're doing in the Midwest, um, colleges, high schools, uh, our events, we have politicians lining up to come to speak, business people that want to, this never happened before. So that's, that's my hope, is this galvanized voice. And uh, I do think um, the 60s generation that are now in their 50s and going into the 60s, I think there's a, a real natural uh, coming together of the two generations. I, I see that happen. Uh, I wouldn't count my generation out on the count of 10 yet, but uh, I think what's happening is uh, my generation, um, I think, will, will take a, a more responsible role, a purposeful role, because uh, when you work all your life for 65 years and then you're retiring and sitting by the swimming pool or drinking your gin and tonic, you know, it's a little bit more in life than counting your time down. And I think my generation is worldly enough to know that and aching in their heart that there has to be more purpose than chasing the buck and you know, life of luxury. So I think a purposeful life, I've seen that happening a lot, the, of my generation going back into service, public service. And so I'm very hopeful about the movement. But, uh, but um, the, I'll conclude by saying uh, the changes are accelerating in the Arctic, and you're seeing them accelerate now. So uh, time is now to get ourselves and our communities to be positive about this. And I think above all, we really have to be tolerant of people with different views of ours and have patience, even if their views offend us. Just be patient, because you, you'll win them over. I mean, you know, you sometimes got to cut your hair and wear a suit tie, suit and tie, but you'll eventually get them on your side if you're tolerant. So, okay, I'll be around. Uh, anyone wants to come up, talk. I got all evening here. Thank you.